Welcome to my podcast series, Christian Apologetics Made Easy, where I attempt to tackle the big questions and to translate the thoughts of big thinkers and make the arguments more understandable for myself and to talk to you, the Christian and the skeptic, about these questions. Arguments for the existence of God and why Christianity is true. I'm Tarsus Venter, a reconstructive plastic surgeon with a zeal for God, a zeal for truth, and why it is rational to believe. And today's topic, why is Christian apologetics important and why would a life without God be untenable? Introduction to Christian apologetics. You believe in God. Tell me, what evidence do you have that God even exists? You might be asked. Oh, I can give you at least five good reasons, evidence for his existence, and more if you have time. In 1 Peter 3.15 we read, Always be ready to give a logical defense. In other words, be ready to explain. This is what Christian apologetics is all about. In Greek, the term apologia means well-reasoned and thought-out reply or response. Christianity is the only religion with a history based on verifiable facts. For whom is Christian apologetics, one might ask? Well, it is for all Christians. The great commission that we read in Matthew 28 and it is to strengthen the faith of the Christian the more knowledge he gains. It is for parents with children and for the skeptic and the atheist. Basically, what we wish to do is to put a pebble of truth in his or her shoe and pray that the Holy Spirit will change this pebble into a seed that will grow. So what does the scripture say about apologetics? A few important verses in the Bible. 1. Always be ready to give a logical defense. In other words, be ready to explain to anyone who asks you to account for the hope and the confident assurance that is within you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. We read in 1 Peter 3.15. If we have the knowledge, we don't have to be anxious about how to answer the questions that might come to us. We can calmly give a good answer and that will make people think more about what we're saying and the response. And we have, and if we have the knowledge, there should not be any reason to feel apprehensive in any situation. Secondly, we read, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. This we read in Colossians 4 verses 5 to 6. Seasoned with salt, meaning real meaning and truth in your response that will, that will make people remember what you say. But do it with grace. We as Christians must offer graceful and truthful answers, even as we might experience opposition like you talking nonsense. Then ask the question, why do you say that? Which of the facts that I presented are nonsensical and why? Thirdly, we demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. This we read in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 55. Fourthly, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. Colossians 2 verse 8. It is always important to bring people back to the point and point it out if they are attacking you as a person. Let's talk about the arg argument instead of talking about me. You should respond. By the same token, we've got to be careful not in it attacking the person that we are conversing with. If we talk to people about Christ, even if they come with really confronting and difficult arguments, we should carefully listen to them, hear what they say, and it's important to defend what we believe and why 
but always challenge them in what they say. Why do you say that, you might ask? How did you come to that conclusion? Or what are the sources of your knowledge for what you are saying? We can be in a position to demolish every argument, every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. If we equipped ourselves well, Christ who created heavens and earth is the truth and we have the truth on our side. If we gain the necess necessary knowledge, no one can stand up against the truth of Christianity. A large number of philosophers in the world are non-Christians and some are outspoken atheists with very clever arguments. But if you carefully sit back and think about what they are saying and listen to Christian philosophers' arguments, one can always come to really good responses. There are 10 questions one can ask the non-believer and help them to rethink their position. These questions form the basis for Christian apologetics and we as Christians should familiar, familiarize ourselves with the answers to these questions. Question 1. How do you get something from nothing? The beginning of the universe. Secondly, how do you get life from non-life and what is life? Thirdly, how do you get a mind, consciousness from matter? Four, how do you get design without a designer? The fact that everything around us look as if designed. Fifth question, how do you solve the problem of evil? If there's no God, there can't be evil, but evil is real. Sixth question, how can life be insignificant and have no value? If we are mere matter in a purposeless universe, what gives us as humans value? Seven, how can life be meaningless? If there is objectively and ultimately no meaning to the universe, no goal with the existence of the universe, how can there be meaning? Nine, uh, correction, eight. How can there be free will if we are just a physical brain and nothing more? And the ninth question, uh, how can there be no human identity? Your physical body is always changing. Why do you say, stay the same person? Let's look at the answers of some of these questions or the response to some of these questions. How do you get something from nothing? The Bible teaches that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Throughout history, scientists for millennia believed that the universe was eternal. There was no beginning which was in direct opposition to what the Bible taught. Before God created, there was nothing. From the early 20th century, uh, astrophysical evidence emerged that there was an actual beginning, and in the mid-60s, this concept came the accepted model under the scientific population worldwide. It was accepted that there were a beginning and people could no longer deny it. The evidence is overwhelming and we can ask the question, if there was nothing and now there is something, what and how did this happen? If we don't believe that there's a God that created at some point in the past, there is just no other answer. Theories like the multiverse or the oscillating universe are mere theories with no basis. There is just like zero evidence for it. These are attempts, desperate efforts to avoid the fact that the Bible can possibly be correct, that there was a finite beginning from nothing. The second question, how do you get life from non-life? Early in the history of our planet, the earth, everything consisted of inorganic material, rocks and dust, and all the elements of the earth. What happened that inorganic material changed into organic material and then life emerged from this organic material? How did life start? Scientists have no explanation, not even what life is. Science might possibly be able to explain this in future, but to exclude an intelligent mind, one who guided and designed the process, 
would be difficult, if not impossible, to explain. Nobody knows what life is. We can study life and many things about life, but have no idea what it is. It is interesting that if you have a living cell and a dead cell and you put them side by side, for example, two identical muscle cells, the one alive and the one dead, that is immediately after it died, and you study them under the microscope, they will still look identically the same. One can see no difference though the one has life and the other one does not have life. When a cell dies and life goes out of it, what happened? Where did this life go? And what was it? There is no answers to these questions. We don't know what life is. Third question. How did we get a mind and consciousness from matter? And what is the mind and what is consciousness? There was nothing, then something. Inorganic material turned into organic material and there was life. But even more astounding, organic material developed consciousness. And we do not know what consciousness is. Nobody knows what it is. It can be studied, but we do not know what it is. We can study and know a lot about inorganic material, about organic material, even so about life and consciousness, yet we have no idea what life and consciousness are. How do you get design without a designer? Fourth question. Observing the universe, the design and the fact that it is so finely tu tuned is just totally amazing. What are the arguments for intelligent design? And I quote Stephen Meyer here. Firstly, the foundation of life and the DNA molecule. There is a four-character digi digital code that is responsible for producing proteins and protein machines that cells need to stay alive. DNA coding uses four bases, namely cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. This appears to be very digital. DNA is a code carrier, just like ROM of a computer, the read-only memory, or RAM, the random access memory. And the attached hardware stores, the hard disk, your flash drive with memory sticks, etc., are code carriers. The sequence of cytonine, guanine, adenine, and thymine in the DNA forms the genetic code for the information or the instructions for producing proteins. It is comparable to the digital code of the zeros and ones in the computer language. The computer processor uses this two symbol system of zeros and ones for instructions or information. We know from our experience, from uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning, that information comes from intelligence. Whether we're talking about the information in a computer program or information in a paragraph in a book or assembly instructions or information embedded in radio signals. Wherever we see information, we always come to a mind. That information always comes from a mind, not from a material process. So the discovery of information as the foundation of life is decisive evidence for the designing mind in the origin of life. Secondly, the argument from fine tuning. Physicists have been discovering since the 1950s that the basic laws of physics and the initial conditions of the universe were set up just right to allow the possibility of life within very fine tolerances. For example, the strength of gravitational attractions or the expansion rate of the universe. If any of these factors were off by the slightest of a fraction either way, life would not have been possible in our universe. One great astrophysicist, Sir Fred Hoyle, was an English astronomer who formulated the theory of, st uh, of stellar nucleosynthesis and he was not a Christian. He stated that 
a common sense interpretation of the facts, that is the facts of the fine tuning, suggests that the super intellect has, monkey, has monkeyed with the physics as well as with chemistry and bi biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The number one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Thirdly, intelligence. A transcendent form of intelligence in that the universe had a definite beginning. And this is something that came into our awareness through astrophysics and as astronomy over the last hundred years. As scientists formulated what was first called the Big Bang Theory. And this is simply stunning that the material universe, if you go back far enough, reaches a singularity of point where matter, space, time and energy themselves all came into existence. As a consequence, there's really no material explanation that can be posited because it's matter itself that came into existence in a finite time ago. Even time and space apparently began at that point. The first words of the Bible in the beginning obviously comes into mind and modern uh, astrophysics has discovered that there was in fact such a beginning. So we have evidence of design but also evidence of design from the very beginning of the universe, of the fine tuning of the universe. The fifth question, how do you solve the problem of evil? What is evil if God does not exist? If God does not exist, evil is not even possible, but evil is real. How do you solve this problem? If you are an atheist, evil is just bad luck. Evil and suffering, just bad luck, just the way the dice falls. But in Christianity, suffering has deep meaning and implications. Sixth question, how can life be significant and humans have any value? If we are but merely high developed animals, what gives human value and value more than animals? Seventh question, how can life be meaningless? Objectively, ultimately have no meaning. Where does meaning come from in a, in a universe that will ultimately burn up into nothing? What ultimate significance and meaning can one's life possibly have if you evaporate into total nothingness at death? If that who is you becomes less than a vapor and your con consciousness not even a memory? Eighth question, how can there be no freedom, no free will? If we are the end product of highly evolved animals and our brain development functions purely through neurochemical reactions, how can one explain rationality and free will? The materialist and athe atheist have to accept that we have no free will. Sam Harris, one of the most famous new atheists, wrote that free will is so convincing that we all believe that we have it but we don't have it. And that also applies to rationality. We as Christians believe that God is a rational God. He created a rational universe and we are created in His image. We have a rational mind that can investigate this rational universe. But for the atheist, there is no reason that the universe should be rational. There was a Big Bang and now everything is rational. And it's all based on rational, immaterial mathematics created by God. Mathematics is not something that you can hold in your hand. You can work with it, but it is an immaterial concept. And the whole basis of the universe is based on the principles of mathematics. So you have to have a rational mind separate from your materialistic uh, physical brain to understand it and know how to work with it. And the ninth question, how can there be no human identity? Your physical body is always changing. And every molecule, every atom in your body is constantly replaced, but you stay the same person. 
In Christian apologetics, all these subjects are well addressed and explained. So let's look at the topic, why would life without God be untenable, if not absurd? Three things are important. Firstly, meaning and purpose in life. Without God, why would human life have any ultimate value if everything is going to end up with the universe in a dark, cold death without anyone to remember anything? Secondly, where does value of humans come from? What gives us humans value? Would it just be the individual or the society's opinion of giving it value? What is the basis then of human value? We as Christians know that God created us in his image, which puts us apart from all other life on this planet and gives us immense value and equal value to all races and all sexes. The atheist might fight for these same values. He believes it, but he has no objective basis for what he believes. Thirdly, and the same with moral values, how do we know what is right and wrong? Is it because of a standard outside of us, a perfect transcendent, transcendent standard on a, which we would call then objective morality, or is it just the individual's opinion which is subjective morality? Subjective morality, which can only be an opinion either the individual's opinion or the community's opinion or a culture's opinion. But which one would it be? Which opinion are you going to accept? Or is there objective morality outside of us? In other words, a perfection that we can measure everything against. Man is the only creature in the world, in the whole of the universe, who asks why questions. Why am I here? Why have I been created? The logical conclusion of the material, materialist or the atheist is that we are no more than a byproduct of the universe, the result of time, matter, chance and space. That through billions of years, the right kind of matter came together at the right time and here we are. A byproduct of chance with life and consciousness and rational thinking and that there is no reason for our, for our existence. If that is the case, the why question, why do we exist, becomes a dark and terrible answer. The philosopher Lawrence Ansley said, if God is let out of the equation, the only prospect is that all will end up, the whole universe, the universe will end up in a purposeless death. Science tells us that the universe will eventually run out of useful energy and so does the Bible that there will be an end to the present order of the world and the universe. Modern man thought that he could get rid of God especially over the last 200 years. In the western world more and more people believe there is no God, want to believe that there is no God but the problem is in killing God humans have orphaned themselves. Suddenly they have no hand to hold to guide them, to give them value, neither meaning in life. Suddenly there was nothing to hold on to. God is dead remains one of the most famous quotes of the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Christopher Hamilton wrote that Nietzsche was haunted by God and his talk of God. Humans need to have something to hold on to. The problem is, if you don't worship God or hold on to Him, you will worship other things in life. Put your hope in other things and meaning of your life in other things but God, which are all temporary and when these collapse, your life collapses. Or you, or you have to find the next thing to hold on to, to worship, but you are in reality an orphan in this world if you reject God. Without God, man and the universe are doomed to nothing more than a cold, dark, purposeless death. Science tells us that the universe is running out of usable energy and eventually everything in the entire universe, universe will end up in death. We know that the world was created with a specific amount of energy, that is usable energy, and this is slowly getting less and less. Entropy 
is a measure of the amount of energy in a physical system not available to do work. As a physical system becomes more disordered and its energy becomes more evenly distributed, that energy becomes less able to do work. And eventually the whole universe will run out of usable energy and collapse into a dark, cold, lifeless nothingness. In the words of Sartre, a French philosopher, the universe is marching irretrievably to its grave. There is no hope, no escape for humanity. And the Bible confirms that the heavens and earth will come to an end in accordance with science. For the Christian, we have the hope of a new heaven and earth that will be created. But in the atheist view, each individual will pass out of existence when he dies. And what ultimately meaning could there be in this? Does it matter if you have lived or not lived at all? If you believe there is no God and you were on this earth for a brief period and then disappear out of existence and become like before your birth, that is with no consciousness, no conscious mind and non-existence of any memory or recall. In other words, zero significance exists for you as a person. What was the point of your life? Whether you were good or bad, and eventually nobody would remember you or that you even existed. Ultimate meaning is what it is all about. One's life might have meaning today, create its own meaning, but ultimately at the end of it all there will be no meaning because everybody and everything will die, disappear out of existence. Nobody will remember anything. So does it matter how one lives? But we cannot live like this. The world will turn into utter chaos, but if God exists, what we do and how we live becomes greatly important today with eternal consequences. Science and the Bible tell us that there was a beginning and tell us there is going to be an end. Each of us will die and the human race will stop to exist. The universe is heading towards a cold, lifeless, lightless, chaotic conglomeration of stars swallowed up by black holes and nobody will remember anything that happened and it will be of no significance. This is the horror of modern man not believing in God. Because he ends in nothing, he is ultimately nothing. He is doomed to a purpose, purposelessness in a forgotten vacuum of, of nothing. Words from William Lane Craig Lest there is a God that will do what he promises to create a new heaven and new earth. So even though living a life believing there is no God and therefore that there is no ultimate meaning, man cannot live like this. It is in the fiber of our being to find meaning in life and live like it has meaning. People live as if their lives have meaning. We are like butterflies who flutter for a day and think it's forever. These are the words of Carl Sagan. But we read, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here for a little while and then it's gone. James 4.14 To create your own meaning in the face of ultimate purposelessness all seems pointless. It is in reality living a life of self-delusion. Morality what does morality even mean without God? If there is no God, there is no perfect standard to compare us to. C.S. Lewis said that unless we know what a straight line is, we cannot know what a crooked line is. God is our perfect standard. We measure ourselves, our lives, our values, uh, the way we judge against this perfection. It guides our morality and is the source of knowledge to know what is right and wrong. This is what objective morality is. This notion means that morality is natural and already in our nature and should be universal and is not up for interpretation. Objective morality conforms to the nature of God and is written on our hearts. If not, it becomes a mere matter of opinion. How can you criticize anyone for his personal opinion? 
What can the basis be for questioning someone? If we are just the product of unguided matter, time and chance, where does moral where do moral values come from? How did it even show up in the universe? Subjective morality, in contrast to ob objective morality, is just an expression of taste, whether individual or collective, a subjective feeling or relative judgments. The implication are that we cannot judge war. We can't say some, someone is wrong in, in his decisions. We may know what is right or wrong, but cannot justify what is right or wrong uh, in subjective morality. It is just an opinion against someone else's opinion, and one cannot judge or criticize the one who differs, differs from us. And for the strict materialist or athe atheist, the opinion is the mere product of neurochemical reactions in the brain, and there is no standard outside of the brain to measure it against. Just a neurochemical opinion against the neurochemical opinion of another brain, and there is no basis for telling someone that he is right or wrong. If our final outcome in life is to disappear from existence, it means our existence is no more than from nothing to nothing. Human seeks meaning and purpose in our hearts, just as the Bible says eternity is written in our hearts. Deep inside, we know it's not the end. We all wish or hope that there will be something more than the final day. If we are honest to ourselves and we say there is no God, then we cannot be but in a situation of despair. If God is dead, man is dead, man is orphaned himself, and there is no future hope. But what is the truth? What we believe is not of essence, but what is true, is what is important. Nietzsche stated that the implication of no God is nihilism, that it is impossible to know anything at all, and all values are based on nothing especially moral values, as there are no basis for it. If one is a convinced atheist, then this would be the necessary conclusion. Without God, there is no goal or purpose in the universe. Man is merely a biochemical machine controlled by altering genes, which implicates no free will and no rational thoughts. Frank Turek often states that in the materialistic or atheistic view, we are just moist robots. That, it's all, that is all what we are. Material particles put together by an unguided process and purely by chance over billions of years. And therefore, no free will outside of us. However, the Bible tells us that we have a soul, a mind or a spirit, which are basically all the same thing though with different capacities or dimensions. This is the immaterial facet of our being. And this is where free will is realized and our rational thoughts originates in the image of the immaterial God we are created. Consciousness and our minds are not the same as our bodies. The body is different and the Bible talks about the carnal man, the flesh, that we have to fight against. Our material body and our mind, the soul, is in constant conflict, in a moral fight all the time, and that is what puts us apart from animals. We were given a free will to fight the basic instincts, the carnal desires of the body, to choose between right and wrong. The less we fight these basic instincts, and the more one gives into the fleshly body, the more animal-like we become. We see this, these actions in criminals, but also in everyday people, caring just for themselves without regard to fellow humans. Hard business people walking over others for own gain, acting animal-like to advance themselves, self-care their first priority. But if one becomes focused on the spiritual being, one moves closer to God, towards what God created us to be, and, and we will care more and more for our fellow man. But if you don't believe in God, it's very hard to travel on this road. 
and it's often done only for self-gain. God gives us, through the Holy Spirit, the strength, ability and wisdom to and the power to fight this carnal man with, in ourselves and become more Christ-like. Three philosophers, not believing in the existence of God, concluded. Firstly, Friedrich Nietzsche said, There are two possibilities. Face the absurdity of life or live valiantly with courage and determination. Atheist Bertrand Russell said, Build your life on unyielding despair. And Albert Camus, his solution was, Come to terms with the absurdity of life, then learn to live in love with one another. But if you talk about love, you're actually stealing from God. God is love and, is only, and He is the only source of love. Without God, we're in a desperate situation and have to try and make the best of reality. Francis Schaeffer is an American Christian philosopher and he described the two-story universe that we live in. On the lower level, it is a finite world without God. In other words, a life where there is no ultimate meaning or purpose in life. And if you are a materialist, this is where you live. You believe that everything came from nothing with no goal or purpose and will end in nothing. Even if you try to create purpose, eventually it will come to nothing. But the upper level is a life with meaning, purpose and value because of our belief in God, that He has created the universe with a purpose. To live happily and constantly without God in the lower level is impossible because you would, would live in despair. If you are honest and consistent with your belief. So what people do is to jump to the upper level even though not believing in God. Saying things like, I believe in love, they would claim. Or I believe I have to care for other people. But where do one get the idea that other people have any value? And statements like, I want to live a moral life. But then again, if there is no objective morality, it's just a matter of opinion and totally unpredictable and can change from moment to moment. And these statements and views are jumps to the upper level by the materialist. You have to be consistent and live in the lower level without God and be unhappy or be inconsistent and dishonest and jump to the second le level in order to be happy and give meaning to your life. Modern man lives in the lower level because he believes there is no God and he cannot live consistently and happy at the lower level. So he takes these leaps of faith into the upper level where there is meaning, value and purpose, where there is true morality, where there is love and where there is value of the human being. But he has no right to do that. He would be inconsistent and dishonest with himself and only be in a dis uh, position of despair if he stays on the lower level. People cannot live like this. Nobody can live like this. People often argue that one has to create one's own meaning. But this is only possible from a free will, to freely choose, which implicates a jump to the second level. One does not have free choice and free will on the first and materialistic level. If we are just material, just moist robots reacting to chemical reactions in our brain, there is no free choice and you cannot create your own meaning. So people are really trapped on this lower level. And to create meaning to your life is to take a leap of faith to the upper level. So let us look at ethical values. Where does that come from? British philosopher and atheist Bertrand Russell said, I don't know where ethical values come from. I do not understand it. Obviously he can't because he believes we are matter only and how does matter produce ethical values? Dostoevsky wrote, all things are permitted but man cannot live like this. Everything in him cries out, do what is wrong but he does not know why. 
That is, if you don't believe that there is a God, that there is objective moral values. That's the same as with Bertrand Russell. We know that things are right and wrong, but we cannot explain it without God. Sartre admitted that the Holocaust, Holocaust was wrong and could not live consistent with his denial and absolute ethical values. He admitted that the Holocaust was wrong, but could not understand why he felt it was wrong. We know it is wrong to kill other people, but if it's just your opinion against someone else's opinion, why is it wrong? What makes it wrong? What is the thing that actually makes it wrong if God is left out of the equation? Atheists might fight for women's rights, which is obviously the right thing to do. But if God does not exist, then m women have no equal value. In nature, main, males are dominant, but nobody can live, such a de live with such a dehumanizing view. But if God doesn't exist, then women doesn't have equal value if we are just highly involved animals. In 90% of the animal world, the male is dominant. So what makes us different? Why should we treat, treat women as equals if we are just highly evolved animals? But we are created in the image of God and he made us all equal. All races, all sexes are equal. But the materialists have no basis to state this. Francis Crick, the scientist who with Watson first described the DNA molecule, also an atheist, said in observing and describing the DNA that man is no better than a laboratory specimen, that what we are are just laboratory specimens. And Peter Singer, Peter Singer, an Australian moral philosopher and atheist, agrees that Down syndrome babies, babies with spina bifida, etc., could just be killed. They have less value than some animals. There's no reason for them to live. By implication, by implication, just specimens, laboratory specimens gone wrong. The, athe the atheist who is true to himself, honest to his worldview, would necessarily come to these conclusions. But saying, no, all humans have equal value, is dishonest in their belief system. There is no basis for believing all humans have equal value in a materialistic worldview. In the animal kingdom, it is survival of the fittest. So if Putin wants to wipe up Ukraine, to use it all for himself, why can't he do that? If he's just a highly evolved animal with his opinion against the opinion of other highly evolved animals, animals wipe out other animals to gain territory for themselves. To create purpose is a self-delusion, as I have alluded to. Ernst Bloch, German Marxist philosopher, said that the only way modern man lives in the face of, de of death is by subconsciously borrowing the belief in immorality from his forefathers, what they held, even though he himself has lost and has no basis for believing it since he does not believe in God. He believes that life ends in nothing, and this is hardly sufficient to keep his head high, to work as if there is no end. Carl Sagan said, as I have said before, we are like butterflies who flutter for a day and think it's forever. Bloch makes this leap of faith to live as if immortal, which is inconsistent to his belief, jumping to the second level to borrow from Christianity. No one can live without having any prospect of a future. One has to believe that although knowing it's not true, subconsciously you borrow from the, sec borrow from the second story to be able to find meaning in, in one's life. The dilemma is that the postmodern man denies God's existence with a consequence of absurdity of purpose, meaning and objective moral values. Without God, Life is ultimately without meaning and purpose. If you are consistent in your belief and living this, you will be pr profoundly unhappy. To live happily demands a lie. 
Man desperately tried to escape this. L.D. Ruhr, an American philosopher, offered the noble lie option. We deceive ourselves by means of some noble lie, thinking that we exist in the universe that has meaning. You've got to believe the lie, otherwise you will be consistently unhappy, and that is what most people do. They would believe that there is meaning in life, and that there is purpose in life, and that people has value, but they have no basis to support this belief. Our quest for personal wholeness and self-fulfillment becomes only relative to the individual. In order to live, modern man must live in self-deception. But once you see the lie, it doesn't work anymore, like a placebo. Not knowing it is a placebo, it might work. But the moment you know you are taking a placebo, it will not work anymore. And so atheism fails. Biblical Christianity offers meaning, value and purpose. The existence of God makes sense of morality, makes sense of the moral force behind the moral law, of shame and guilt, of equal rights and makes sense of human value. What is behind shame and guilt? Why do we have shame and guilt and why does it exist if we are merely highly evolved animals? A life without the existence of God makes no sense and is simply incoherent with reality. God is the best explanation for the meaning and purpose of the universe, for our very existence. He is the best explanation for human value and for morality. We should not cling to our beliefs, right or wrong, but cling to what is true and to the evidence. The unexamined life is not worth living. Aristotle if you found what was argued here useful, please give it a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. Share it with your friends and family and also on your social media. This will be of a huge help to spread the message of why it is rational to believe in God. The facts that parents, children, students and people wondering about the reality of God should know and perhaps find helpful. 